that uh, most of us are healthy, we can be up and about doing the things we need to do. Order of service this morning, uh, Lance will lead our singing, uh, reading will be by Blake Bolay, prayer by Mr. Kemp, lesson by Brother Scott and the Lord's Supper, ended by Brian Franklin, I don't see him here. Is, uh, he, he's not here, he's in jail today. So. Okay, someone else will uh, need to take care of the Lord's table again. Maybe Kent, has Kent got Kent's got the prayer. Well, we'll, we'll get it done. <laughs> anyway, okay, uh, the, all the announcements will, the other announcements will uh, keep going after the service this morning uh, before we close today. And let's begin with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day you've blessed us with and the measure of health that we have that we can be here this morning. And we pray that as we worship you, we will do this in a way that's pleasing to you. We will worship you in spirit and in truth. And then help us to apply the, the things that we've learned from uh, your word, uh, from Brother Scott this morning, and apply them to our lives and, and be doers of your word and not hearers only. We beg for your forgiveness and your mercy and help us to uh, uh, be attentive to the things that's uh, being done here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Psalm number 709. <coughs> 709. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace. And so fulfill the word when each can feel his brother's side and with him bear a part when sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to heart when free from envy scorn. Sweet and dear is she in every action glow. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of death who finds his bosom. Five hundred seventeen. <clears throat> Next song is five seventeen. <clears throat> Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shout is dispelling with joy, I'm telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my life was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my 
Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe, riches eternal and blessings supernal. From his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. <clears throat> when at the cross the Savior made me whole, made me whole, my sins were washed away and my life was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. Number 147. 147. <clears throat> the soul. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing out his love for me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. The song before reading and prayer be 837. <clears throat> 837. <clears throat> <clears throat> I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No will be the next song. 674.
This morning's reading will come from uh, John chapter 8, verses 48 through 59. John 8, 48 through 59. The Jews answered him, Are we not right when we say you are the Samaritan and that you have a demon and are under its power? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I honor my father, and you dishonor me. However, I am not seeking glory for myself. There is one who seeks glory for me and judges those who dishonor me. I assure you most, uh, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if anyone keeps my word by living in accordance with my message, he will indeed never ever see and experience death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon and are under its power. Abraham died and and also the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never ever taste death. Are you, uh, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets died too? Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is worth nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Yet you do not know him. But I know him fully. If I say I did not know him, I would I would be a liar like you. But I do know uh, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was delighted. Then the Jews said to him, You are not even fifty years old, and you claim to have seen Abraham. <coughs> Jesus replied, I assure uh, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, before Abraham was born. I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus concealed himself and left the temple. Pretty good. Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for this opportunity to come together this morning to be together a group of Christians that love you and we we lift you up this morning in praise. We thank you, Father, for the songs we are singing, the, the joy that we get from singing the songs to you, Father. We uh, thank you for those the words that we sing and, and the thoughts they put in our hearts and our minds. Father, we thank you for what it does to us preparing for this service to set our minds right and get our, get our minds on things that uh, are about serving you and uh, helps us to concentrate on things of this service rather than things of this world. Father, we ask you to be with Scott this morning as he gives us a lesson, and he's, the words he studied, that we can uh, think about the things that he's saying and how to, how to apply those in our life to make us better service for you in the world that we live in each day. Help us, Father, to have to let our light shine and to be the example that we should be on this earth, to uh, have a, lead a life that others would want to be a part of, that they can know that we're different than everybody else, that uh, even though we may be a little different, that it may be something that they might want to be a part of. Well, Father, we're thankful so much for Jesus Christ who died for all of us, that uh, he gave his life so we might have opportunity when this life is over. Well, we know this is no small thing, and it's, it's the greatest blessing of this life, that we have an opportunity to spend eternity with you because of the blood that's shed for us. We're grateful, Father, for this time that we come together to be together, to be here and worship together. We don't take that lightly, and we, we, we are thankful for that blessing. Father, we ask you to be with those this number who are hurting, those who have lost loved ones, be with the family of Max and Sula Trafagan, and uh, the family of Bobby and Lynn Shader. Father, we know that they are hurting at this time, that they're trying to figure out how to deal with their lives without them. Just help them to have comfort, Father, to know that you're with them, and that you love them, and that their love was are in a better place. We know, Father, that they are in your hand, and they are comforted. Father, we ask you to be with us all as we live our lives, to appreciate what we have, to be thankful for every blessing that we have, and, and that life is truly a vapor, that it just passes by so quickly, but that we need to make the most of the moments that we have, and to spend the time with our loved ones that we can, and, and remember that you are the giver and taker of all things, and that uh, we should be thankful for every blessing we have. I ask Father to be with us for the rest of this service, be with all those who are going to be here this morning because of uh, fear of the pandemic that's going around. Help them, Father, to deal with those things so that they can get back to their life as normal. 
us all, Father, as we go through this trying time. Father, help, help it to be a revival that, that folks would turn back to you, put you first in their lives, and to remember that you're the maker and the giver and, and the one who saves us from all things. We ask these things in Jesus' name this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Six hundred seventy four. Song of Invitation. 912. passage in uh, the book of John, today, John the 8th chapter, where we read, there could be no doubt, I don't think, about who Jesus is saying that he is. In fact, at the end of that reading, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, he used the exact same term to describe himself that God used with Moses when he met him in the wilderness. Remember when Moses said, well, when I go back to the children of Israel, who shall I tell them sent me? To you. And he said, tell them that I am has sent you. So the same phrase used there in Exodus is the one that Jesus uses to describe himself here in John chapter 8. Uh, so there's no doubt who the Father is in this case and who Jesus is and who Jesus is saying that he is. However, it has been, uh, you know, pretty common and maybe you've run into people that will say, well, Jesus was just a good man. He, he was a, a great philosopher. He was a great psychologist. Uh, he was charismatic. He was all these things, but they think that he was just a man and that he wasn't who he claimed to be. You know, his distinct claims of being God eliminate, though, this popular idea of skeptics who regard him as just a good moral teacher or just a prophet or uh, someone who said a lot of profound things. And so often, this conclusion is passed off as the only one acceptable to those who are intellectual, to those that are smart, you know, the, the elite among us. Uh, they say, well, you can't say he's the son of God and the virgin birth, are you kidding me? What What is all this? So. They say he was just a great philosopher, a great man. 
The trouble is that many people just nod their heads in agreement and never see any fallacy in this kind of reasoning. And so what we want to look at a little bit today is this idea that was expressed by C.S. Lewis uh, a number of years ago in some of his writings. And Lewis, of course, was a professor at Oxford University first, finished his career at Cambridge University uh, in England. And in one of his books, Lewis writes, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. And then Lewis added, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so in all the places where Jesus speaks about himself, and there are countless in the Gospels, he claims to be the Son of God. Now I'll tell you one other thing that a lot of times the skeptics say. They will say, well, Jesus never said these things about himself. That's the next comeback a lot of times they'll give you. He never said these things. John and Matthew and Luke and Mark, they wrote these things, but that's just what they thought about him. And they put words in his mouth. They sometimes will take that tack. Kenneth Scott Lorette, a historian of Christianity at Yale University, wrote, It is not his teachings which make Jesus so remarkable, although these would be enough to give him distinction. It is a combination of the teachings with the man himself. The two cannot be separated. You know, Jesus claimed to be God on more than one occasion. And he didn't leave any other option open to us. His claim must either be true or false. And so it is something that should be given serious consideration. Jesus question to his disciples, as recorded in Matthew 16 and 15, is, but who do you say that I am? You know, he had asked earlier, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some of them think you're Elijah the prophet or another one of the prophets. Some of you think, uh, think that you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. He said, but who do you say that I am? See, remember, the apostle Peter makes the confession. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus didn't correct him say, oh, no, wait a minute, Peter. Now, that, you're getting a little ahead of yourself. I'm not that. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Messiah. I'm not the son of God. His answer was, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to you that art Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And of course, the rock on which the church was built is the confession that, Jesus, or that Peter had made. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And suppose then that his claim to be God was false. If it was false, then we only have two alternatives. Either he knew it was false, or he didn't know that it was false. And so we're going to explore for just a little bit these two ideas. Under this heading, he was either a liar or a lunatic. First of all, was Jesus a liar? If when he made his claims, he knew that he was not God, then he was lying and deliberately deceiving all of his followers. And if he was a liar, though, he was also a hypocrite because he told others and taught others that they ought to be honest at whatever cost, while he himself, if he wasn't really who he said he was, was living a colossal lie. And more than that, he was a demon because he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claims, and he knew it, then he was unspeakably evil, you know, to lead others into thinking he is this and that he's giving them some kind of comfort that he can't really give. 
And last, he would also be a fool because it was this very claim that he was the Son of God that led to his own crucifixion. So he'd not only be a liar, but he would be a fool if that's the case. Many will say that Jesus was a good moral teacher, but we need to be realistic. How could he be a great moral teacher and knowingly mislead people at the most important point of his teaching, his own identity? You would have to conclude logically that he was a deliberate liar. And of course, this view of Jesus doesn't coincide with what we know either of him or the results of his life and teachings and things we read about him. Wherever Jesus has been proclaimed, Throughout the world, lives have been changed for the better, for good. Nations have had channels of love opened up, and unjust persons become just. You know, everywhere that the gospel has been preached, there are a lot of things that happen that go hand in hand with it in third world countries over the, over the years. Whenever the gospel goes in and it's preached, there are hospitals always that grow up. There are care for orphans and widows that always follows in the wake of the gospel coming in to an area. And all of these good things always follow the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever it goes in the world. Now, you don't recognize this fellow, but he is William Lakey, uh, Great Britain. He was one of the noted historians. He was a dedicated opponent of Christianity, and yet, like he writes, it was reserved for Christianity to present to the world an ideal character, which through all the changes of 18 centuries has inspired the hearts of men in passionate love, with an impassioned love, has shown itself capable of acting on all ages, nations, temperaments, and conditions, has been not only the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive to its practice. The simple record of these three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. And that is one of his critics. A critic of Christianity writes this about. You may have read something that this man wrote sometime. This is Philip Schaff, who was the author of a great history of the church. Schaff wrote, how in the name of logic, common sense, and experience could an imposter, that is a deceitful, selfish, depraved man, have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to the end the purest and noblest character known in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality? How could he have conceived and successfully carried out a plan of unparalleled beneficence, moral magnitude, and sublimity and sacrifice his own life for it in the face of the strongest prejudices of his people and age. Of course, this is one who is on the side of Christianity, but again, he makes a great point about Christ. Was he a liar? You know, if Jesus wanted to get people to follow him and believe him as God, why would he go to the Jewish nation? And why go as a Nazarite carpenter to a country so small in size and population and so thoroughly adhering to the undivided unity of God? Why didn't he go to Egypt or even better to Greece where they believed in various gods and various manifestations of them? You know, if you were just looking at it and you were making this plan, this di diabolical plan to deceive the world, it looks like it would have been better to go maybe to Greece or to Egypt or somewhere else, anywhere, besides the nation of the despised Jews. Someone who lived as Jesus lived, taught as Jesus taught, and died as Jesus died could not have been a liar. You know, we might think that someone would try to perpetrate a lie for a while and, and carry it on, maybe for whatever reason it might be, to gain popularity, to have the goodwill of people, maybe even to make some money. But when it came down to crunch time, and they're about to put you on a cross because of who you say you are, then it may be time to backtrack. 
you know, say, well, no, I'm just kidding. As I, I, wasn't, I didn't really mean everything that I was saying. But he didn't do that. He went to the cross. Well, he wasn't a liar. If he wasn't a liar, if he didn't know, you know, what he was saying was a lie, then he must have thought it was the truth. So was he a lunatic? You know, it is inconceivable for Jesus to be a liar. Then he couldn't actually have thought or of himself to be God, but he could have been mistaken. After all, it's possible to be both sincere and to be wrong. You know, a lot of times we've been sincerely wrong about things. But we must remember that for someone to think himself God, especially in a fiercely monotheistic culture, and then to tell others that their eternal destiny depends on believing in him is no flight of fantasy, but the thoughts of a lunatic in the fullest sense. So the question is, was Jesus Christ such a person? Was he just deluded? Was he just a lunatic? You know, someone who believes he is God sounds like someone today believing himself to be Napoleon or Hitler or someone else. He would be deluded and self-deceived and probably he would be locked up so that he wouldn't hurt himself or hurt someone else. Yet in Jesus, we don't observe the abnormalities, I'll get it out in a minute, and imbalance that usually go along with being deranged. His poise and composure would certainly be amazing if he were insane. Can you imagine an insane person with all a lot of time, all the commotion that was going on around Jesus and all the crowds and those that were around him and demanding things of him to completely keep his composure? Can you imagine the lunatic going through the mock trials that he went through? And just calmly sitting there and not saying a word. You know, just letting people make accusation after accusation against him. Noise and Cobb, in a medical text, described the schizophrenic as a person who is more autistic than realistic. The schizophrenic desires to escape from the world of reality. But let's face it, claiming to be God would certainly be a retreat from reality. But in light of the other things we know about Jesus, it's hard to imagine that he was mentally disturbed. Here is a man who spoke some of the most profound sayings ever recorded, and his instructions have liberated many individuals themselves from mental bondage. A lot of the things and the comfort that he gives brings help and hope to people who are having some mental issues or emotional issues. Clark H. Pennant asks, was he deluded about his greatness, a paranoid, and an unintentional deceiver, a schizophrenic? Again, the skill and depth of his teaching support the case only for his total mental soundness. If only we were as sane as he, according to Pennant. A student at a California university told Josh McDowell one time that his psychology professor had said in a class that all he has to do is pick up the Bible and read portions of Christ's teaching to many of his patients, and that's all the counseling that they need. Was he a lunatic? Psychiatrist J.T. Fisher states, if you were to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified of psychologists and psychiatrists on the subject of mental hygiene, if you were to combine them and refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage, if you were to take the whole of the meat and none of the parsley, and if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed, by the most capable of living poets, you would have an awkward and incomplete summation of the Sermon on the Mount. And it would suffer immeasurably through comparison. For nearly 2,000 years, the Christian world has been holding in its hands the complete answer to its restless and fruitless yearnings. Here rests the blueprint for successful human life with optimism, mental health, and contentment. 
you know, reading the Psalms, reading in other places. Uh, I've often said one of the greatest passages in Philippians 4 for mental health, if there's anything that's lovely, true, good, you know, think on these things. That's great advice for our mental health and our emotional health. C.S. Lewis wrote in another place, the historical difficulty of giving uh, for the life, sayings, and influence of Jesus any explanation that is not harder than the Christian explanation is very great. The discrepancy between the depth and sanity of his moral teachings and the rampant megalomania which must lie behind his theological teaching unless he is indeed God has never been satisfactorily explained. Hence, the non-Christian hypotheses succeed one another with the restless fertility of bewilderment. And so what Lewis is saying here is that the biblical explanation and Jesus' claim for himself is the best explanation of who he is because he is who he said he was. Well, if he was not a liar and he was not a lunatic, and if we look at the evidence, we conclude, well, you know, he couldn't have been a liar, he couldn't have been a lunatic, then what he said about himself must be true. He is Lord. Josh McDowell writes, I cannot personally conclude that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic. The only other alternative is that he was the Christ, the Son of God, as he claimed. When I discuss this with most Jewish people, it's interesting how they respond. They usually tell me that Jesus was a moral, upright, religious leader, a good man, or some kind of prophet. I then share with them the claim Jesus made about himself, and then this material on the trilemma, liar, lunatic, or Lord. When I ask if they believe Jesus was a liar, there is a sharp no. Then I ask, do you believe he was a lunatic? The reply is, of course not. Do you believe he is God? Before I can get a breath in edgewise, the resounding, absolutely not. Yet one only has so many choices. The issue with these three alternatives is not which is possible, for it is obviously that all three are possible. <coughs> Rather, the question is which is the more probable. Who you decide Jesus Christ is must not be an idle intellectual exercise, though. You cannot put him on the shelf as a great moral teacher because that is not a valid option. As the Apostle John wrote in John 20, verse 31, he said, For these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and more importantly, that believing you may have life in his name. You know, the evidence is clearly in favor of Jesus as Lord. Some people, however, reject this clear evidence because of the moral implications involved. They don't want to face up to the responsibilities or the implications of calling him Lord. You know, if he's just a great philosopher, there are a lot of philosophers, and some we may agree with, and some we may disagree with. And so we may just choose to disagree with him. We can just set him on the shelf as a philosopher and go on about our life and our business and not be bothered. But if he is Lord, that is a game changer. That means we can't just put him on the shelf with other philosophers or other men and just ignore things that he says. If he is indeed Lord, then he has a right to command us. He has a right to expect things from us. You know, throughout the scripture, we are confronted with the fact that in passage after passage, the Bible tells us that Jesus was Messiah. He was the Son of God who came in the flesh and lived among men. We have Peter's confession we referred to earlier in Matthew 16, 16. When he had asked, you know, who do men say I am? They gave him all these answers, popular opinions about who he was. But then he asked the most important question that any of us will ever answer when he asked, but who do you say that I am? 
Because see, it doesn't matter what your neighbors say about Jesus. It doesn't matter what the rest of your family says about Jesus and who he is, as far as you're concerned. The most important thing is what you say about him. Who do you say that Jesus is? And of course, Peter says you are the Christ, and that's the great foundation of which the church has been built. In Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus was on trial, it was a mock trial, uh, before the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and others, the Sanhedrin. The one who was then high priest said to him, By the living God I place you under oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you, in the future you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And so yet another place where Jesus clearly says who he is. He is the Messiah. He is the one who was to come. You know, we've been studying on Wednesday nights the book of Mark. You remember, we began with the ministry of John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah and prepared the way for the Lord to come, for the Messiah, for this one who the Lord was sending. And how that John continues to point the finger to Jesus. On one occasion we read in the book of John, and this is John the Baptist who is speaking. When certain disciples were there and Jesus walked by, and this was after his baptism at the hands of John, Jesus, or John the Baptist pointed and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he was indicating Jesus. So throughout Scripture, the Bible claims that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. He claimed that himself. Those who wrote about him and wrote for the early church wrote with the same premise that Jesus is Lord. And as a result of that, we have a responsibility to respond to this truth. Because the way we respond has eternal implications for all of us. You know, Jesus said on more than one occasion, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So we have a responsibility for ourselves to respond in faith to him. But we also have a responsibility, I think, as his children and as his followers to tell others that you know, they need to accept him for who he is. They need to make him Lord of their lives because that's the place that he deserves to occupy in our lives. He isn't just a great philosopher, although he was a philosopher and he had great philosophy. He isn't just a moral teacher, although he taught the greatest of morals. He is the I Am. The great I am, the living God who came and lived in the flesh, who lived among us, who suffered in the flesh as we suffered, and finally went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And so now we must respond to his loving invitation. You know, one of the last things that's said in the book of Revelation is that whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. And that water of life is Jesus and his gospel. We extend again his invitation to you today. If you've never responded, you never have obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that because this is the response that Jesus expects from us as his followers. So if you're one today, we can assist. We invite you to come while we stand and sing. <clears throat>
Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Birds are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Birds are lifted at Calvary. Calvary. is very near. Bear in mind this morning for the Lord's Supper, let's sing uh, 287. <coughs> 287. Go ahead and open up your cup, your cup if you have, get that out of the way. It's a very good lesson this morning from Scott on who Jesus is and, and what he's done for us. And uh, very well laid out. I like, the, I like the way that he approached the lesson this morning. Jesus Christ asked us to remember him and what he's done for us his death on the cross we take this time to remember what Jesus Christ did that he gave up his body to be crucified, to suffer an agonizing, cruel death so we might not have to do that ourselves no one else could do it, what he did for us only Jesus could do that great thing for us his blood was shed his side was pierced, his side was pierced and humiliated on the cross for us. We take this time to remember Jesus Christ's broken body. We do that by remembering that the blood represents his, or the, the bread represents his broken body on the cross. We'll give thanks for that blessing. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this 
bread which represents your broken body on the cross. We're thankful, Father, that uh, you suffered on our behalf. Thankful, Father, for carrying our sins with you in that death. We take this blessing, Father, and remember these things as we take this bread in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Father, for the blood that was shed on the cross. Father, we thank you for uh, the blood that washes away our sins, making it possible for us to inherit life when this life is over if we've been found faithful. We take this through thine help. Father, help us remember your shed blood on the cross for us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. have an opportunity to give back the portion we've been blessed in a material way. Uh, we do that by, by giving of our money so that the work of the church might continue. Um, we'll offer thanks for that blessing. And if you uh, want to contribute to that, when you leave this afternoon, you can put your, your money in the, in the contribution plate at the back of the building. Or if you use Venmo, you can use Venmo and, and don't forget to, to do it. It's easy, easy to forget, so don't forget to use Venmo if that's your choice. So we give thanks for our material blessing at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the things we have to enjoy in this life. We thank you, Father, for the comforts that we have and the, uh, the means to make money and to uh, provide for our families and to do the things we enjoy and the things that we uh, want to do. Father, we ask that we think about those things and, and how we've been blessed. And remember that you are the giver of things. And, and Father, we thank you for all things that you give us. As we have an opportunity to give back, of course, we've been blessed. Father, helps to uh, give from our hearts freely to remember that you loved us to bless, enough to bless us those things and help us to love you enough to give back the portion you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, God, for the good lesson this morning. You know, the world would be a lot better place if we all tried to live by the teachings of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But there's so many that uh, attempt to even destroy his, the word that God has left us to live by. But uh, we know in Matthew 24, 25, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but by no means will my word ever pass away, so it can never be destroyed. Okay, uh, several announcements. Uh, hope I don't forget anything here anyway. We'll see you. Uh, Mr. Lisa's here this morning, says so she's doing much better. And this uh, Van Blanham, Hayden of the Spring Hill Congregation, has a tumor on the brain going to have surgery to remove that. Uh, says it'll take uh, about between five and nine hours to perform this procedure. And Michelle's uncle, Preston Brazell, has been diagnosed with lung cancer. Says PET test or scan shows it is not spread and there's only one spot in his upper right uh, lung. They think it's aggressive kind, but they, they'll have a biopsy to uh, see for sure that uh, that's what it is then uh, decide on the course of the treatment. Of course, we know that Sister Lynn passed away Thursday night at home. This station will be tomorrow, 4 to 8, at the Living Beetle in the uh, funeral home in Prairie Grove. And due to the, uh, the COVID situation, they'll be just having a graveside service at the pavilion.
William, the Burlington Cemetery of NAM on Tuesday, August 18. So we remember, we remember them in our prayers and, of course, continue to remember Sula and Max's family. Remember all those that can't be here and uh, hopefully that things will get somewhat normal in the future when hopefully this plague will, will pass. Okay, it says, many teachers went back to school this past week, or will, and it says, please be in prayer for them and their support staff as they uh, manage in-person and remote learning to be positive influence on the children. Also pray for the administration, so work to, in the difficult decisions on how to manage school safety for all. And it's gonna be a gonna be a hassle it looks like for the teachers and those Cindy teachers in Tennessee and she went back last I believe it was last week, maybe this week. And in person. So it's it's a problem all over this the whole country and in fact the world. And uh, Michelle gave out cards to everyone this morning. I think everyone possibly got one. And uh, she would like to have a bird. Well, let's, let me read this. Many teachers started back to school last week, or will be this week. It's going to be a tremendous amount of work and filled with unknowns. Teachers are having to teach in person and remotely at the same time, nearly doubling the amount of work that goes into a single day. Then there, then there is the virus and all that comes with that. Michelle knows that the Lord's in control. He can handle anything that comes her way. But sometimes we lose focus and are overwhelmed and we need a reminder. She's asking for your help with this. You're given an index card. She would like you to do the following. Write down your favorite Bible verse or short passage. Uh, you don't have to write it out, but you can. If you're inclined, write a short note of advice or encouragement to you write your name on the card. She's going to keep these cards uh, in a box in her desk and we'll pull one out each day. It'll be a reminder for both God's love and your love towards her to keep her focused on the things that truly matter. Excuse me. I left one thing back here. family of Max Trevacan acknowledges the grateful appreciation, your kind expression of sympathy. It says, to my church family, first, many thanks for all your prayers, phone calls, texts, and expressions of sympathy. To the wonderful ladies that prepared the delicious meal for all my family, I cannot thank you enough. And last but not least, to Scott for his lovely tribute, visits, and prayers. I don't know what I would do without my church family. When this COVID-19 is over, I can give you all hugs. Thank you all. I love you all. I love all of you. Suba. You know, it's good to have, uh, you know, a church family members, uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that we can lean on, you know, in bad times. You know, I don't know what people do that don't have this blessing. So uh, it's good to it's good to know that other people actually do care and do want to help. I guess that's all that I have. I, I usually miss something. Uh, anything else should be said at this time? Uh, the ladies gonna meet outside. At that's the right. Okay, I wrote that down too. There you go. Ladies meet outside uh, to decide on the meal for the Shader family. All the ladies, please attend that. Okay. Let's see. I believe uh, we have Rusty down as uh, our dismissal prayer. And uh, I think we'll sing one verse of, of uh, Be With Me, Lord. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without. 